All right, everyone, I am here with a very exciting interview today. I am joined by the Reverend Will Gaffney, PhD, who is an Associate Professor of Hebrew Bible at Bright School Divinity, sorry, Bright Divinity School in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, she is the author of Womanist Midrash, a reintroduction to the women of the Torah and of the throne, which we are going to be discussing mostly today, but is also has an upcoming commentary on Nahum, Hab Habakkuk, and Zephaniah, and previously authored Daughters of Miriam, Women Prophets in Ancient Israel, as the co-editor of the People's Bible and the People's Companion to the Bible, which are, are all uh, out there and available and should be checked out. Uh, Will, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, so before we... My pleasure, Liam. Thank you oh, for having me. You're welcome. Uh, before we get into uh, Womanist Midrash specifically, uh, it's clear from those texts that you have, uh, you're both an authority on and have a passion for the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament. Uh, I was wondering what led you into that uh, and, and what sustains you now that you're there? So I think that my love for the Hebrew Bible is cultural. Um, I observed when I was in seminary and then later after when I did a bit of a targeted study that the text of the Hebrew Bible seemed to be the most canonical text for people of African descent in the Americas. Mm. Uh, my findings were that it was the Hebrew Bible and the Jesus stories. Uh, but those were the stories that I learned as a child and the ones that stuck. Um, more specifically, when I was in seminary, I read Howard Thurman's Jesus and the Disinherited and was introduced to the notion of the religion of Jesus. Uh, someone asked him in India, why are you a black man, a Christian? They, they've enslaved, they've done genocide, you know, they're mm -hmm. terrible. And his response was, I'm not a follower of Christianity, I'm a follower of the religion of Jesus. And so that idea sat with me and as I processed it, I came to understand that the religion of Jesus is rooted in the scriptures of Jesus, which are of course the scriptures of the Hebrew Bible. So that sort of sealed it for me, but it really started with the stories I learned in my faith and in my culture. Hmm. Yeah, great, thank you for that. So, uh, Going on to Womanist Midrash now. Now, um, perhaps there are going to be people listening here who both those two words are, are new uh, or, or unfamiliar. Maybe you've heard them, but you don't really know. So maybe you could give us your best kind of, we do this occasionally in interviews, a bit of conceptual lightning round. Um, maybe your best, preferably tweetable, but I won't hold you to that, um, definition of like maybe womanist and then Midrash. Sure. Womanist is black women's feminism. Womanism is black women's feminism. It comes from the definition by Alice Walker. And the best way to think of the relationship between the two is also her words. Womanism is to feminism as purple is to lavender. So womanism is a richer, deeper, thicker feminism. Awesome. I think that's terrible. Yeah, I reckon that's great. That, that, that captures it really well. So Midrash is a type of biblical interpretation. It is a classical Jewish form and more broadly refers to uh, scholarly interpretation of the text, paying attention to words and letters in Hebrews, and also includes filling in spaces in the text with questions or even supplying the answers to questions. So some people will think of Midrash as retelling a story. That's only a part of it. Classically, it's a type of scholarly interpretation or exegesis. Right, thank you. Uh, so in another interview and through the book, you, you talk about the way uh, Midrash relates to and connects with the African-American church tradition of sacred imagination in preaching. Uh, could you expand a little on this connection? and share with us some ways you think this yes. book might expand and support preaching in the contemporary church. Right. So one of the things that Midrash does is take the text and begin to fill in the spaces in the text with questions, with commentary, with rich description. And I realize that that's something that African-American preachers do. They often signal it in my experience with the words in my sacred imagination or in my sanctified imagination. Mm -hmm. So even in a situation where a preacher is from a tradition where the Bible is understood literally, 
um, they still go beyond the text. So someone may say, in my sanctified imagination, I see David in his chariot, leaning to the side, riding on 22s, right? Talking about the type of spinning wheels, dubs, uh, that are very popular on cars in some contexts. Well, obviously the Bible doesn't say that, and those pastors and preachers know that, but their congregations give them permission because they have signaled with the words sacred imagination or sanctified imagination that they're going beyond the text to paint a picture. And so I've heard all of this rich language, uh, some seriously rooted in the text, working with uh, the words of the text, uh, sometimes coming out of Hebrew if they have that kind of scholarly training, otherwise doing close readings. And I realize uh, that the use of the sanctified imagination in black preaching is a type of indigenous midrash. And so I make that connection in the book. Yeah, great. Thank you. I um, I'm, it was reflect like it reminded me of like, I know James Cone talks a lot about uh, the importance of for black churches that their preacher can tell the story kind of thing and like you know bring so much into it and and, and bring it to life for the congregation in that moment. So yes. yeah, I mean, it's to see that connection. So um, what led you, I guess, broadly to to want to take this project on, and, and maybe specifically what drew you to that kind of twofold uh, women of the Torah and of the throne. Well, I'll answer the second question first because it's very simple. I wanted to do the entire Hebrew canon. Smaller than I was thinking. And I was even thinking of a multi-volume project. I was going to do Torah and prophets and writings and deuterocanonical women. Uh, so as we looked at the material I had, um, they said, well, let's see how we can group it and what we will keep and what we won't. So we went with the women of the Torah because that's where most of the women that uh, generic readers of the Bible are familiar with. And it was important to the publishing house that there be recognizable women. In one iteration of this project, I was only going to do women you'd never heard of uh, to teach people women they didn't know. Uh, the women on the throne uh, came about uh, in part because of the popularity of Game of Thrones, uh, but also because I was aware from my lecturing and teaching that there are these 20 Judean queens whose names are preserved in scripture. And the names in the Hebrew Bible of women represent only about 9%. So that's a large block of women whose names are preserved. So we decided to build a frame around uh, the royal women. And so that's where the two halves came from. Mm. I alluded to the first question when I said I really wanted to do a book on women no one had heard of. I wanted to introduce people to uh, the women of scripture, particularly those whose names we know. Mm. So of that 9% of names uh, that are known in the Hebrew Bible, 9% are women's names, that comes down to, I say, 110 for those who know the Lord of the Rings will understand that math. But if you ask people, name the women you know in the Hebrew Bible, you know, you're gonna get six or eight. You're not gonna get 111. So my earlier impulse was to do a book on the women people didn't know, those 111 who are named, and some of the categories that people don't think about. So if you say that Joshua slaughtered all of the Canaanites in a city, then I like to open that up in translation and say the women, the children, the men of war fighting age, the men who were too old to fight, um, the pregnant women in childbed, like what does, what does it mean to say Canaanites, put face on them, and then tell the story of all the stories uh, through the women. So, you know, the Israelites left Egypt, um, then I might uh, translate that expression that means children of Israel that used to be translated as sons of Israel as the daughters and sons of Israel, um, making the women visible in places where they are swallowed up in a crowd. So that was the initial vision. Mm. Oh, great. Thank you for that. Uh, so you mentioned uh, translation there, and I know that uh, your own translation plays a big part in uh, your work here and in uh, Daughters of Miriam and, and, and the People's Bible. So um, 
like translation is a very key aspect of the Christian faith. Like Lamen Sinar um, talks about, you know, uh, Christianity is a translating religion, um, comfortable mm. in all cultures. And uh, Andrew Walls kind of talks about how Christianity rests on a divine act of translation, the mm. word becoming flesh. Um, so translation is, is right at the heart of this whole thing. Uh, mm. For you, what is the, the importance and the, the, the beauty of translation uh, in your work and how you see it kind of almost uh, playing off this, uh, you know, the heart of translation in the Christian faith itself? Sure. So speaking specifically from as a Christian and as a priest, mm -hmm. uh, I like to use creative language for divinity. And one of my earliest uh, Trinitarian formulations, and we're going to put an asterisk by that because people who know me know I'm not really a Trinitarian, <laughs> but I like threefold language. Uh, so one of my earliest Trinitarian formulas is the author, the word, and the translator. Mm -hmm. uh, so tra translation in terms of biblical uh, material uh, interest of focus for me uh, in really even before seminary. I knew uh, as an unlettered person in, in theology that the Bible was translated out of Hebrew and Greek. Didn't know what all the implications were, but I did other languages when I was in high school and college, so I understood that there are going to be some issues at stake moving from one language to another language, whether it's a sacred text or not. As I started to work with uh, Hebrew in seminary, I just fell in love with it. Um, as a, as a scholar, point of scholarly inquiry, that really developed during my doctoral program when it became really clear to me that translation and interpretation are different sides of the same coin, and depending on a scholar or scholarly committee's um, intellectual commitments, social and political commitments, and religious commitments, a text can wind up looking quite different. Mm. So here's an example I give students in my intro class. Uh, the first verse of the Bible, uh, God is presented with a masculine verb uh, and a masculine noun. Verse for Elohim. When beginning, God created. One could say he created grammatically. And because of all of this masculine, masculine God language, these masculine verbs and masculine nouns, God is most often masculine in translations of the Bible. That grammar is there and sustains that. The very next verse says, uh, And the Spirit of God, she was hovering or fluttering over the face of the waters. Well, no one has ever seen the feminine pronoun there in spite of the fact that it's used pervasively through the Hebrew Bible, and one might say nearly exclusively something like, I think I got it down to about 97% of the time, uh, Ruach spirit is translated feminine. Mm -hmm. So what happens? If you look in your English translation, you will see the spirit of God or spirit of the Lord, depending on the text, was doing whatever the spirit is doing. So instead of using a pronoun, they use the proper noun. Because if they use the pronoun, then you would have to use the feminine pronoun. So they don't translate it incorrectly by putting a male pronoun, which doesn't belong. They just obscure that it's feminine by always using the proper noun. And in English, we mix up proper nouns and pronouns all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm having an interview with Liam. He's interviewing me. I don't talk by saying, I'm having an interview with Liam. Liam was very kind to invite me on. I really appreciate William for having me on. At some point, I throw in a pronoun, but you don't see the pronouns with the spirit. So once I saw that practice, which I don't regard to be innocent or happenstance, I understand to be intentional. Let's not confuse people. Well, what's the confusion, right? The text uses both languages. Now, in terms of the practice of Christianity and to some degree, the practice of Judaism, there are people who have blue fits when a pastor or priest uses feminine God language because they don't recognize it as being biblical. I think it matters that that language is already present in the Bible and the text has been translated in such a way that it's not visible to the people. So one could argue that I'm being a literalist in using that language, that I am conserving that part of the biblical tradition, 
So that was really the issue around which translation emerged for me. And there are many, many other examples, and uh, I try to illuminate a number of those in Woman is Midrash. Excellent. Thank you. Um, well, we, you kind of already, you're touching on there, uh, translation, there's a, a political side to translation. Um, now, uh, womanist and black theologians have pointed out the kind of political and, and often dangerous act of being black in a white space. Uh, I think especially if Kelly Brown Douglas's work, like Stand Your yeah. Ground, explores this uh, yeah. in excellent detail. Uh, in many ways, your book seems to be kind of... And let me just say, uh, yeah. Dr. Douglas was one of my seminary professors. Oh, wow. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's great. Uh, yeah. She, uh, I, uh, hopefully, we'll get to interview her someday. That's a hope as well. <laughs> um, so, in many ways, your book seems to be making space and kind of announcing the presence of figures and individuals who may have been you know, pushed to the margins of the biblical witness and, and, and to the margins of Christian tradition. Do you see parallels between your like, womanist midrash and the act of kind of you know, being black in a white space? I do in that biblical studies is, is a largely white space. Hmm. And it's not just that my translation is political, all translation is political. Mm -hmm. All knowledge construction is political. Mm -hmm. um, biblical studies, like all post-enlightenment studies, rest in the perspective of the white, sexual, heterosexual, uh, able-bodied, uh, upper-middle-class, uh, well-educated male. And so it was not the tradition to identify that setting, but simply to say, this is the perspective, right? Um, so marginalized scholars identify ourselves and, and our perspectives, but we are not bringing perspective to scholarship. Um, perspective is always present in scholarship because it's a part of personhood. Um, so uh, I am centering characters uh, who have been at the margins, and that is certainly analogous to the ways in which uh, black women, other women of color, men of color, uh, people of diverse sexualities and presentations, and diverse types of embodiment and mobility have been marginalized. Um, it's also the case that in terms of academic knowledge and even religious formation, Certain claims about the text can't be held if the sample size is small. So by that, I mean that you can't say that you've studied the prophets if you've only studied the prophets who have books named after them, you know, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the, the little 12. Because um, if you do that, um, then you miss all of the women prophets. Um, you miss all of these funky prophets who show up and do various and sundry things like get eaten by lions and uh, just all kinds of, but you haven't studied the prophets. So you could build a case about prophecy in ancient Israel in terms of prophetic books that are disclosed and miss the fact that most of the prophets in the Bible don't have prophetic books associated with them, right? So you've misunderstood the genre by focusing on such a narrow slice. And I think that's the issue with putting uh, so-called marginal characters uh, at the center. In fact, the course I teach on prophets is called Prophets on the Margins, and it focuses entirely on all of the prophets who don't have books associated with them. Oh, that's cool. People should check that course out. That sounds great. Um, so you mentioned then uh, that Yes, the, the biblical studies is a predominantly kind of white, uh, male, able, um, hetero field. Uh, there seems to have been a recent maybe upturn in published works by, uh, in womanist biblical studies. I'm thinking of like our former guest, Stephanie Buchanan Crowder, who wrote uh, When Mama Speaks, uh, yeah. or um, Nyasha Jr.'s Introduction to Womanist Biblical Interpretation, like just as a couple mm -hmm. of examples. Do you see a growing emergence in this area? And I guess, what are your hopes for over the next 10 to 15 years of um, biblical studies more broadly, womanist biblical studies? What are some, I guess, uh, terrain you'd like to see explored or, or barriers you'd like to see knocked down? Yes, there is uh, a wonderful abundance of womanist biblical 
uh, material right now. Some of it has been in the pipe for a while and the peculiarities of the publishing industry sure. has meant that these books are coming out seriatim. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also Mitzi Smith's uh, award uh, winning I Found God in Me, which is an anthology of womanist texts and a uh, relatively recent one published by the Society of Biblical Literature, Vanessa Lovelace and Gay Bynum, also an anthology. So uh, those two anthologies, plus the Crowder piece, plus my book, uh, plus some of the classical uh, ancestral texts of womanist uh, biblical hermeneutics, uh, like Renita Weems' work and Dolores Williams' work, uh, have given me an entire course that I'm teaching this semester on womanist biblical interpretation. So I'm grateful for that work. Uh, that work is just opening up and blossoming uh, as those scholars continue to publish. Uh, most of those scholars are either uh, mid-career or just ascending to full professorship. So they have years of publishing ahead of them. And so I certainly see more of that work coming. What I think will happen is that womanist biblical scholarship will uh, continue to be intersectional. Uh, I've seen link linkages with the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, I, I've seen texts like uh, Pamela Lightsey's, which is not uh, biblical, it's theological, but she does biblical work in it. Um, Our Lives Matter, a queer womanist theology. Uh, so I see womanism uh, intersecting with other voices and demonstrating that to be womanist is not a singular thing. It's not necessarily to be Christian, it's not necessarily uh, to be heterosexual. We also have perspectival positioning. So I expect to see uh, very rich womanist work in biblical studies and in other parts of the uh, religious guild. So in theology, um, in uh, history and Christianity, in ethics, uh, there's a very rich tradition of academic womanist work in theological ethics. So I expect to see it continuing to blossom and unfold. Mm, great. Thank you. So uh, Womanist Midrash, uh, as you say, charts and, and expands and, and explores a number of different uh, characters in scripture. If I were handing you over the keys to a major Hollywood motion picture, <laughs> and I'm like, which, which woman needs their story told on the silver screen? Uh, you know, who, who are you going to choose? And I'll, I'll give you bonus points if you want to name some uh, you know, you know, some stars to, to help lead the film. But uh, oh yeah, I don't know. Goodness. Who are you going to choose? <laughs> Who am I going to choose? That is such an unfair <laughs> Well, one of the stories that I've loved for a while that I preached on and written on on my blog that always is so well received is Shira, the woman uh, who is known for building three cities in uh, the ancestral period. And so I think sort of a saga of mm -hmm. what it took to build a city in an ancient world. You know, we're talking rudimentary uh, Iron Age, not, not even Bronze Age in terms of where the story is set. Mm -hmm. um, I think that would be a fabulous story. Yeah. But in terms of maybe a single character who has been misunderstood uh, whose story I think would change the way people engage her, I would have to say Isabel, Jezebel. Um, uh, I think that would be a powerful story. Um, her, her dramatic death, her power. Um, and then a last one would have to be Athalia, who ruled Israel uh, as I describe her as a king. She didn't rule as a queen, she ruled uh, as a solo sovereign. Um, the years of her rule that are missing from the biblical text because uh, they were prosperous and the Bible doesn't like her and doesn't want to say good things about her. And since they can't say she bankrupted the, the country or lost a bunch of territory, um, the story of her exp uh, maintaining, expanding, going to war, winning, um, you know, I want to see her in her chariot with her sword. Um, those are three characters that I would commend to Hollywood. There you go. I will, uh, I'll just start tagging production houses with this interview and try to see what we can make right. happen. Um, and in terms of 
actresses. Um, I don't have specific actresses, but the the actresses would have to be phenotypically appropriate to play Afro-Asiatic characters, which means they could not be white. Um, and they and their entire cast uh, need to come in the entire range of, of browns and blacks that's appropriate to what is really Africa when you talk about it geologically, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. And I, I make that claim because uh, the Jordan River, which forms the boundary of, of Israel uh, in antiquity and in modernity, even though there are a couple tribes on this other side, on the Asian side, uh, everything to the left of that is Africa and everything to the right is Asia. Mm. And that determination is made by the geological plates. The Syrian geological plate comes into contact with the African geological plate and the sort of jointure is the Great Rift Valley, which runs from the Nile all the way down to the Zambezi. So when you talk about how the continents connect, that side is Asia and that side is Africa and Israel's on the African side, right? So cast appropriately. Yes, <laughs> which um, is just a blanket rule for any history channel or otherwise uh, biblical drama, please cast appropriately. Um, so I, I mentioned up top that you've got a, a commentary on Nahum, Habakkuk and Zephaniah coming out as part of the Wisdom Commentary series. And I think that'll be released, when I looked at it yesterday, it's about 17 days yeah. away, I think. So when this comes out, less than that. So go online, people, and look about pre-ordering or ordering. Um, could you tell us a little about that? I think what's going to be a really, what is already unfolding as a groundbreaking series. And what was it like writing this commentary uh, as part of that series? Well, the Wisdom Commentary series is groundbreaking because it is an explicitly feminist commentary series, and by treating the entire uh, biblical canon, uh, Hebrew Bible, uh, New Testament, and Deuterocanonical apocryphal works, it becomes the first and only complete feminist commentary. Uh, there are many commentaries that do some of the books or some subsection, but this is the first encyclopedic hmm. commentary that is feminist. Um, I really enjoyed uh, the writing of it and the thinking through of it, it helped me that I was assigned three very tiny books. Each is only three chapters. So from the beginning, uh, laying out on a black, blank piece of page, it was pretty simple. My volume was three books. Divide that into third, one for each book. Okay, divide each chapter into three, you know, each book into three chapters. So I had a, a rudimentary structure. That orderliness helped me. Um, what I came to appreciate is even more the great diversity of the prophetic texts that are bundled together as the Minor Prophets or Book of the Twelve. They are just entirely different books, and those three could not be more different. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. Um, kind of with this, uh, talking about the Hebrew Bible and, uh, and your work in it, um, Brent A. Strawn uh, wrote a book recently, The, the Old Testament is Dying. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I haven't uh, read it, but I, I've, I've listened to him talk about it. But essentially, he treats the uh, Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, like a language to show how mm -hmm. in, it, you know, in the use of it, it's becoming pigeonized and, and dying out, and uh, both in society and in the church. Um, now, I, 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 let's just say we're taking his diagnosis as accurate. Um, how would you want to see... Uh, churches engage with the Hebrew Bible to, I guess, uh, bring the language back to life, to help it flourish? Is it through kind of a, a midrashic, um, I don't know if that's the, the word, but um, a midrash kind of uh, approach? Is it is it through throwing out the lectionary? What's the, uh, or, or diving further into the lectionary? What, what do you feel it could be to keep the, the, the text alive? First, I'm not even going to accept the premise because that observation cannot possibly be in conversation with the varieties of black Christianities in this country. That observation may be true for dominant culture churches, uh, particularly churches that use the lectionary and that subset of lectionary churches that believe that the gospels only preached by preaching the gospel text in the lectionary. So 
when you narrow the focus to those, and if you do what you what uh, I did earlier in this interview, say these are the delimiters, and here's where the perspective is from, then you can talk about that. But that statement cannot be made for all Christianities in this country, and I absolutely don't accept it uh, as a person who is a Black Christian, even in a predominantly white church like the Episcopal Church. So I, I just can't even uh, accept that as a premise. For those churches that are finding the Hebrew Bible silence, um, I recommend that they take a look at how they understand the biblical text functions. The lectionary can be a gift to the church. It can frame uh, the scriptures and the gospel. Uh, but a, a priest, a pastor, or preacher who preaches the designated gospel text out of a reflex because they think that's the only way to preach the gospel or to tell the story of God, uh, I find that person to be an impoverished preacher. Um, if we take the by now old saw rubric of what would Jesus do? Well, Jesus preached the gospel and he didn't use the New Testament because it hadn't been invented yet. In some ways, the New Testament is the story of Jesus preaching the gospel in the prophets and in the Psalms and in the book of Proverbs and with his own parables and stories. Um, so one, people simply need to preach the Hebrew Bible. It's an authorized text in the lectionary cycle. And there are times when people need to step away from the lectionary. Further, we must recognize that not all churches use the lectionary cycle. Um, so I think it's incumbent on people to make better use of the resources they have um, and not to imagine that what they see in churches that mirror them in any way reflects the great diversity of Christianities in this country, let alone around the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Thank you so much for that. I, I appreciate the, the challenge to the, the premise. And as I think you're right from what you said at the beginning, like your love for the Hebrew Bible came because of how robustly it was engaged with uh, yeah. in your tradition. So yeah, I appreciate that. Um, re remembering is an important uh, theme in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I feel from my limited engagement. Um, there are many invocations to Israel to tell their story, to remember the past, uh, remember what God has done, especially. Currently, in both the US and Australia, there is an increased focus on how we remember the past. I mean, this isn't new, it's just in the news cycle at the moment, especially around uh, the idea of, of monuments. Mm. Um, in Australia, it's monuments which uh, misremember the past, claiming that mm. Captain Cook discovered the country um, mm. you know, 60,000 years after the Aboriginal people were, were here. That's the longest surviving civilization that's still here. Uh, or, or those monuments in the States that are, are, are celebrating those who, who fought for slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, so resistance to removing these monuments or changing the way we tell uh, the history of the land of the country is often framed in the need to remember or protect a particular story mm -hmm. uh, in some way or another. Um, I was wondering, given your, your expertise and your work, whether you had insights into this current conversation uh, about remembering and how that how maybe we can learn from the Hebrew Bible what they mean by remember the past. And, or maybe you just know from your own just experience of living in the States. Well, the Hebrew Bible is the story of Israel's relationship with their God and the land told from their perspective. Renita Weems said something like, uh, the Hebrew Bible is the story that Iron Age folk tell about their Stone Age ancestors understanding of God, right? But it's not the Canaanite understanding of the land, and it's not the Phoenician understanding of the land. It's a set of freighted, weighted, and heavily invested stories. And so we have the opportunity when we preach the text to tell another story. So one of the, the narratives that I use in my teaching uh, is a piece by Robert Allen Warrior, uh, whose uh, well-known essay, Canaanites, Cowboys, and Indians, mm. tells the story of the American conquest 
uh, and, and attempted genocide of native peoples through the language of Israelite context of Canaan. And of course, that's the language that was used here in the United States of, uh, you know, settling the West as though there were not, in fact, people who were already settled there. So we can use biblical stories to talk about how we tell stories and from whose perspective and what happens to those whose stories is not told or is not remembered and the violence that that has uh, erasing them from their own tradition. Just recently, um, the story of the Syrophoenician woman bubbled up through the lectionary. Well, Jesus went to the coast. He went to Tyre and Sidon. And so she's indigenous in her land. He's an immigrant, uh, yet they have an ancestral history in which his people claim that God gave them her land. So underneath the story of will he heal her daughter? What did he call her? What does it mean to say a dog? There's uh, these two bodies, this Jewish man and the Canaanite woman on her indigenous land with a man from the people who is occupying and colonizing her land. At the same time, his people are occupied and colonized by the Romans, right? It becomes a richer and fuller story when we remember to tell all of it. That's great. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, I need a, I'd love to be in Fort Worth, Texas, taking your classes by the sounds of things. That sounds great. Um, so, uh, one of the, a little uh, uh, kind of new segment I'm trying out on the show is um, uh, looking at some Amazon reviews of, of your work and, and giving the opportunity to either respond to the positive or, or the negative. I'm partly doing it because I want to remind people that what's really helpful when you buy someone and read someone's book is doing an Amazon review um, and hitting that five star rating. But I have, I have two reviews here, uh, one on the positive side um, for Woman is Midrash and one about the People's Bible, which is interesting so i'll read you the positive one and then I'll, I'll see what your thoughts are on on how that person's wrestling with your text and and your your thoughts there so this is someone who uh is yeah put a review for womanist midrash uh, tyler jarvis is his name i'm just reading part of it okay let me say let yep. me say uh in the interest of full disclosure i know tyler he's my student and he's taking a class with me this semester well, well done, Tyler. This is um, good work uh, to get on and put that review in. But full disclosure is, is out there. But he says, I think this book is a very important book for ministers to read because it causes us to question our received interpretations of many biblical passage. I consider myself to have a fairly open mind when it comes to biblical interpretation. And yet Dr. Gaffney's womanist perspective provides commentary and insights that I, as a straight white man in ministry, had never before considered. And I find myself now questioning how I could have not considered some of these things. This book is a reminder that the Western androcentric approach to scripture does not have a monopoly on biblical interpretation and that serious students of scripture should engage with many other perspectives to try to get a more complex, complete picture, sorry, of what is going on in the biblical narratives. So do you think he's, 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 he's getting what you're going on about there? What, what's your thoughts coming out of that? Review? I think so. And, and what uh, Tyler points to is one of the central premises of womanist work is that our perspectives are beneficial for people who do not share our experiences, right? So womanist biblical interpretation is not just for black women or black women who identify as womanist. Other people are impoverished by not having womanist biblical interpretation to add to their tool of resources. And we are all impoverished when we only have our own perspective or when we only have the perspective of the dominant culture. So that's a really important part of womanism is putting some resources on the table to enrich the community of leaders and interpreters. That's great, yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, all right, so our second review uh, is for the, uh, was for the People's Bible. And this comes from just a seminary student is, is their name here. I won't read the whole thing, but you'll get the picture. Uh, the commentaries to this Bible edition are aggressively anti-Christian and anti-biblical authority. Although the authors present the objective of their work to affirm multiracial, national and cultural diversity within the body of Christ, a wonderful and praiseworthy task in my opinion, 
In reality, the People's Bible Commentary is nothing more than a bunch of angry, historically and theologically inaccurate, random attacks on Christian belief and divine inspiration and scripture. The professors who praise this edition, uh, Puilan and Schlesser Fioza, see the back cover, are scholars whose academic career has been built on attacking Orthodox Christian faith. So there's someone who's maybe not quite as, uh, what we're talking about before about things that deviate from the so-called norm uh, is, is, So that writer is assuming a set of norms about Christianity that all Christians do not share and is attacking a publication for representing uh, a wide variety of Christian viewpoints. The People's Bible is not the conservative Christian's Bible for those who hold to this particular notion of biblical authority, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, So so their review betrays uh, who they are and uh, helps to make our point, I think, more fully that this text, uh, this presentation of the biblical text and the commentaries that accompany it are for Christians who read from a variety of perspectives, taking seriously that uh, Asian Christians and Latinx Christians and native first person Christians and African continental Christians and African American Christians uh, and uh, European immigrants to the United States and Christians who are white Americans who were born here do not read the same way. We don't read the biblical text the same way. We don't configure God the same way. We don't have the same understandings of Christianity. And in terms of what makes for an orthodox Christianity, the way that that student is using the word orthodox is different than the way orthodox Christians use the word orthodox. Mm. So uh, that kind of understanding of Christianity is a silo with no windows, and it means that no light gets in. Mm -hmm. I like, I I love that, that image. Um, What you might be, um, you know, like to know is there are three comments under that who all said, thank you, this review convinced me to buy the book. Uh, So, because as in, they, you know, you (laughs) oh, you must hate it, which means I would clearly love it. Um, I've definitely bought books on Amazon like that before where someone's like, you know, attacks it from a kind of a conservative rigid standpoint. I'm like, oh, I should check this book out. Um, That's great. Well, uh, Will Gaffney, thank you so much for being uh, with us today. Um, Obviously, people are going to go out and buy Womanist Midrash and they're going to pre-order your commentary. Uh, How else can they support you uh, or, or connect with your work online? Well, they can follow me on my blog, which is willgaffney.com. Uh, Will has one L and Gaffney has one F. So you can also follow me on Twitter. Uh, I tweet on things related to the Hebrew Bible, to popular culture, to politics, to the church, biblical interpretation and translation, also sci-fi and vampires. Right. The, um, the audio just blipped out when you said your Twitter handle. So can you just, just say it again for us? Oh, I didn't actually say it. Oh. So thank you. I was describing the content. So thank you for that reminder. My Twitter handle is at Will Gaffney. Great. And, and I, I will say Will is an excellent follow. And if you're not on Twitter, get on it. Um, so, uh, yeah, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, all the best with the, the rollout of the book and, and your upcoming works and for your classes. Uh, I hope they all go very well. Thank you so much.